thought-provoking maybe. Uh, I brought my 11-month-old daughter on this trip and she doesn't like sleeping in the Mexico heat, so I'm exhausted. But I'll try and get that energy going. Um, so the talk I'm gonna give is about uh, AI, which is very zeitgeisty, and uh, academic data in general. So just over, it's an area I'm super excited about because about 2011, I was doing a PhD. I had some data, I had some videos that I needed to publish, I wanted to publish. I did a PhD in stem cell biology. I had lots of videos of stem cells moving from one side of the screen to the other. And I tried to submit them to a paper. So 2011, and they said they couldn't accept videos because they just didn't have the, the tech stack to do it. Uh, and that annoyed me because I, um, A, I then had to write lots of text out saying, the blue cells are moving at this rate, whereas the red cells are moving at this rate. And if you just click the button, you can see the, vid the cells are moving faster. And so um, I started making my data available online on a platform called Figshare. And um, now you lots of universities around the world use it. And it's just over a decade. And about the same time, there was a book that came out it's called The Fourth Paradigm uh, by a guy called Jim Gray at Microsoft Academic Research. And he said, if we just put all of the information that we generate from research online, the machines will eat it all up and start spitting out new knowledge. And that, I loved that idea in 2011, 2012. And I thought maybe in my lifetime that will happen. And then 10 years later, uh, Google DeepMind brought out AlphaFold. Um, and if you're looking for AI, hyperbole, big, overreaching statements, this is DeepMind, Google DeepMind 3 brought out AlphaFold 3 in the start of May. AlphaFold 3 predicts the structures and interactions of all life molecules. That's a, that's a big statement, right? I, I don't know if they will back that up, but uh, what they've done so far is crazy. And um, I think they'll win the Nobel Prize for it. So what they originally did was they took 170,000 protein structures from the protein data bank. Uh, this is the growth of the protein data bank over time. So they got started with data a bit before uh, Figshare or Dryad or things like this. And um, so it's very expensive to reproduce this because every protein structure that they, they have in that database, they say costs about uh, $100,000 to redo. It involves crystallography. It's basically saying if you have a protein, it can fold in many different ways. But, what ha but you can't predict what that structure is going to be just from its chemical structure alone, right? Um, so if you start actively photographing them, you can see that structure. And so DeepMind at launch, so in, I don't know, I think it was 1971 they started. In 50 years, um, they had 190,000 stru structures. Overnight, when AlphaFold 1 came out, um, Google took those structures, took the strings, and tried to predict, could they guess the structure of these uh, proteins based on their string alone? And they went from 190,000 to a million overnight. And then in the next year, they went from a million to 200 million. And if you think that's $100,000 per one that it would have cost, I had to Google what that number is. It's $20 trillion. So in a year, they made advances worth $20 trillion in academia which I thought was really cool. So my question really is, I'll pause here. My question is, this is cool, but it's Google, it's DeepMind, they have infinite money, they're in the private sector. What is happening in basic research and can we expect this kind of stuff to happen in every field moving forward at a, a rate of acceleration that we haven't seen before? So if you're working in protein folding, it's been solved uh, you know, overnight, that's crazy. But if you look at some of the other AI meets data sets kind of things, then it's not all the same. Protein data bank is, here's the file, here's the metadata, it's all the same structure, so machines can eat it very easily. But if you look, so I'll just whiz some through, through some here. Um, you can predict uh, kidney disease in fa and failure in people with type one diabetes from a mixture of data. Uh, you can predict multi-cancer risk over three years using the National Health Resource of Denmark. So that's, 
I went to a talk earlier today where someone was talking about hospital notes and messy data, and you can, you can turn really messy data into really huge clinical practices and uh, predicting type 1 diabetes and timing in children. You may be thinking, these are all life sciences, this is all medicine. Um, we've heard a lot about policy and we've got elections going on and things like this. I thought I'd look and see, if you look at more of the social sciences, what is being done in AI on that side of things. And it's actually the other way around. You know, uh, I assume that in Mexico next week, when the vote happens, you'll get the results of that vote as this person got this many votes, this person got this many votes. It's structured as opposed to, you know, the old way of academic publishing where you say, we found this, and people say, can, can I see the data behind that? And they say, no, I don't have to show you my data, right? Um, so I think that AI in social sciences is already working out. You can get predictive models on who's going to win the election already because the data is well structured. I want to know about the messy data. And this is why the life sciences work so well. AI uh, with drug discovery, I think, is going to be the fastest moving thing. You know, in the next five years, we'll have all kinds of crazy discoveries uh, that in, in health subjects that haven't moved for 50 years, like asthma and what have you. Um, so, AI can speed up drug discovery, but only if we give it the right data. I agree. Uh, hands up if you have heard of the term fair data, if you are familiar with fair data. Okay. So, in academic terms, fair means findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable for humans and for machines, as I have represented there. Um, and policymakers around the world have really got into this theme, right? You get, you get lots of funders around the world saying, we like FAIR. Our interpretation of it might be slightly different to yours, but everybody's moving in the same direction. Previously, different governments were saying, we're doing this with academic data, and people would be going in different directions. Now, at least, like we're saying, let's go to the door. Right, everybody goes to the door. We're moving in the same direction. And um, the problem we have with academic data publishing right now is a lot of it is fair for humans, but not fair for machines. I might find a data set and be like, oh, I can see it's linked to a paper, and in that paper I can look at the methods, but the data set doesn't have much metadata. That is uh, something that I think is not fair for machines yet. So I also have this idea about optimal academic publishing because the invention of the web and the way in which people are disseminating all different types of content. I know you can read this faster than I can, and it's, it's fundamentally flawed, I know this, which is I want optimal dissemination of academia to be fast, open, cost-effective, and trusted. Right? So you can say that traditional publishing is trusted, but nothing else. But trust is the most important thing there. And so if you look at more modern things like preprints, even though they get three uh, out of four, or data publishing or code publishing, they're fast, they're open, they're cost effective, but they're not necessarily trusted because no one's doing peer review, no one's checking the data. Uh, what we do see is that there's loads of data coming out. So um, this is a crazy graph. In the year 2000, there was about two million papers a year coming out. In 2022, there was two million data sets. So there was as many data sets coming out being published as there were publications in, in 2020. Uh, sorry, in 2002. Um, which you might not have heard about academic data publishing, but a lot of it is going on. What's more concerning about that for me is there is a lot of unnecessary paper publishing. There's, it's tripled in the last 20 years. It's not sustainable, there's not enough peer reviewers. People are being invited to write papers, they don't need to do it. We're publishing stuff we don't need to publish. I can talk about that over beers tonight. So, uh, why are people sharing their data? Big, pub big funders like the National Institute of Health, if anybody here is funded by the American National Institute of Health, the biggest funder of life sciences research on the planet, if you publish a paper, you have to make your data available as of January last year. And if you, when I say, Fair data is a global thing. Um, 52 funders on this website that tracks it uh, say you need to make your data openly available when you publish your paper. Or the thing that they haven't got to yet is they haven't got to like 
we'll take away your funding if you don't. So it's, we're going to make you do this, but we're not really going to check on you just yet. But it'll happen. Uh, one of the big problems, we do a state of open data survey every year uh, where we survey people with Springer Nature um, and ask their, their ideas around data publication. And people say, we don't get enough credit for, data sh for sharing data. I know that if I get two publications in Nature, I'm set for life. I don't know that if I publish data, I, it's any benefit to my career other than my peers might try and scoop me, right? So there's this carrots and sticks things going on. On Figshare, the thing that I, I mentioned before, we do have uh, citation counts. So you can see where people are citing your data sets and what have you. Interestingly, software gets cited the most. Uh, but for anybody who's ever written any software, you may have added a readme. You may have described it well so other people can reuse it. And people can't make that jump to data sets to say, maybe I should make it available in a way that other people can reuse it. And so you don't get thousands of citations yet. But you, there is a way to track it, and we are tracking it. Uh, so you've got this carrots and six. Funders saying you have to do it. Uh, we can now have data. If you make your data set available when you publish your paper based on half a million papers in PLOS, you get a 25% increase in citations to the paper. So making your data available helps. So this is really a call to arms on if you work in a field that m creates data, it's, it's the lowest hanging fruit for that acceleration using AI in the next, um, in the next five, 10 years. We did a pilot with the NIH where we said, if you submit your data, we'll have a human in the machine check it before it goes live and say, can you add a bit more metadata so people understand it? Um, and we found, it's very early results, but people added more metadata, people got more views, people got more downloads, people uploaded more files. So there's early indicators that if you have someone helping, holding your hand, uh, then it, it can be good. I'd also just like to point out that, so to go back to Figshare, Figshare is a data repository. You can think of it like YouTube. Anyone can go along, sign up for an account, upload some files, add some metadata, make it publicly available. You get a DOI. You can cite it. Um, there are other repositories that exist, by the way. Dryad, Dataverse, Mendeley. Um, but I've just worked on this one for the last 10 years, so I have the screen grabs. Um, and one of the problems, one of the things I, so we have a free version, and then we have hundreds of universities who have a, a paid version. That's how we sustain ourselves. And one of the things that drives me crazy is the amount of people who come along, they're told to make their data set available, and they call it data set, right? More than 10,000 results found, right? So please describe your data well, because if you go back to fi fair data, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, that's not findable. If you go to Google and put in the word data set, you're not going to get that data set, right? What's really interesting about that particular data set is it does have loads of met metadata. So if, you, if it's linked from a paper, it's probably usable. Uh, but the machines can't eat it. The machines won't be able to find it. And so uh, again, not just picking on one repository. There's other repositories where they say better metadata will result in more reproducibility. So, just to sum up, I'd say if you're working in data, if you work at a university with people, if you work at a, a funding body, offer clear guidance on things that researchers are concerned about, uh, making their data available. People are very concerned about licenses. It never goes away. They don't understand what CCB, YNC, ND is. We have to explain it. Once you know, you know. Um, create resources on how to share, not what to share, not where to share. The uh, repository that has the most data sets linked from papers today is GitHub. GitHub doesn't have DOIs. GitHub, you can delete at uh, any point. So you can cite the data set and then go and delete it. Um, but the repositories all work with GitHub to create snapshots and give it a DOI. And you can say at that point, that's what this looked like. And accept data in your institutional repository if you have one. Um, yeah, this is more of a call for academic institutions. Get a data repository. 
It's basically free for your researchers, and they won't end up sending it away to publishers and paying them $2,000 for every data set they publish, which may happen. Um, so this was my point here. You can see GitHub is the pink line. It's exploding in terms of where the data lives. Um, and the other thing, there's, there's a, a narrative where people say, you should cite the data set in the reference list. And you should, but people don't. And so a lot of people look for citations in the reference list to count them. That's not always where they are. They're offering data availability statements and things like this. So to go back to the data availability statements in different categories, history and archaeology is making it, there are data sets being made available, and I'm sure the machines will consume them and spit out crazy new findings in history and archaeology. But just where the scope is right now, biological sciences, drug discovery is where we're going to see the big, fast turnaround, uh, even with lots of disparate amounts of data. Data availability statements, this is just showing that it's, it's a, 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 10 years ago, no one had them. Now 30% of papers have a data availability statement. It's one of the fastest growing trust markers. And I will finish with this example of, well, the machines can infer new knowledge, right? So the machines might not be able to find things uh, if you don't describe it well. So I did a little chat GPT experiment, as we all do. I took a data set on Figshare. It's called ITS. No idea, yeah. Um, but it has been cited. So we looked at the papers that cited it. We looked at the first paper that cited it. It has the same authors. And we said, can you create a title, a description, categories, and tags to be used in li academic literature for this data set that is referenced in this paper? And it gives you nice descriptive metadata. I don't know these people. That looks good to me from the paper. That looks accurate. It might not be, right? And so I think all of the data that has been made available uh, will get better, even the stuff that seems useless. Um, and I think this is the real question now, is if we're going to use the machines to create not content and then ask those same machines to use that content to create new knowledge, we've got this race between cleaning up the data and using the data. And so I don't know what wins. The machines curate and clean academic content or the machines consume and generate uh, new academic content. So that's everything from me. I have a survey that my, my work colleagues made me put in. So if you would like to take a survey and transformation about academic data, uh, sorry, about academia, please scan the QR code. Otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you, and now we have five minutes for questions. Um, if not, I have a question um, that I usually get often asked, uh, but based on the fixture metadata, uh, do you have any insights on what um, is um, what people are doing good in completing metadata or what's definitely missing? For example, in the case of data side DOIs, licenses is very problematic, but maybe you have other insights. Yeah, when, when I first started this, because of the idea that licenses were confusing, you can only make data available on the two licenses on Figshare, which is CC0, which is anyone can do whatever the hell they want with it, or CCBY, which is they can do whatever they want, but they have to give you credit. And it's not great, because there are real use cases where you might need to have a non-commercial license or something like that. But there are other places to go, you know. We're just trying to, we're just trying to keep it tight like that. The, the biggest change we could see, the two biggest changes we could see, is linking to funding information, who funded this data, and uh, linking, and a descriptive title. But the, the, the funding information is really, is really a, a difficult one to get because people forget their grant numbers, people copy and paste them wrong, and, you know, it's, um, the, the people trying to incentivize people to make their data and, and use their grant information. In, the, in North America, there's a FASEB prize that's going out, which is half a million dollars to whoever uh, does the best reuse of data. The problem it has to encourage more data sharing and more building on top of the data that's gone before, the problem it has is that people just enter who have done that anyway. 
right? So some of the great talks we saw today, I had this spreadsheet of COVID information, I saved millions of lives. You were doing that anyway, right? It's not, it's not incentivizing people uh, to do new stuff, and I think that's, that's really hard is to change behavior in academia. I think the AI happening too fast is what will change people's behavior more than traditional academic stuff. Thank you so much for this very interesting presentation. Uh, I have a quick question about the idea of encouraging authors to you know, clean up the data into Figshare, for example, instead of just dropping the data and forgetting about it. Would it make sense to let the AI propose like a, you know, a summary of the research and let the authors review them immediately before they, they click OK, submit, so that you're sure that what the AI generates to summarize the paper would be okay with the authors? Or is that already in your plans? Or? It's a great idea. Uh, and you know, you know this, is, this is my attempt at that, right? But, but you could, we, we, uh, we do think, people don't read tool, tool tips, which is, you know, please give this a descriptive title, they just ignore it. People do, which I don't think I'm in a position, there's lots of times when you get yourself into a position where you're like, I'm not the gatekeeper here. It can't be just, you know, I make a decision and it affects all these people. Um, but you, if, you, if you put an error into people's metadata, they'll go back and fix it and improve it. So if you spell their name wrong or something. So there's other things you could do. We should do you could tweak the metadata. But yeah, I think that's where we're headed. I think you'll get this saying, that looks a bit light. Shall we fill this in? And they'll say, yeah, that's 90%, right? We'll just change that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, part of the problem with all of this, as I mentioned, is Figshare is free, the free version, and we work with universities. So we have like 50 people, and there's Zenodo and Dryad, and they have teams of developers working. Um, and it's how does that become the priority with your time? Uh, there's, a, there's a National Institute of Health funded thing called the Generalist Repository Ecosystem Initiative where the NIH is giving every generalist repository, they're called, money to work together. And we're in year three, and it's a four-year thing. By year four, we could, do, we could all work together to build something like this. So yeah, I think it'll happen. Very last question, sorry. But Mark, stay in afterwards. Uh, I, I thought the, the charts about like which types of um, uh, research like had the most data um, published alongside the research. Uh, did you look into like where that or like which research articles had data associated with it by like geography or um, I don't know like institution? Just because I, I that could be interesting if you know AI is focusing on the papers that only have data. Like I wonder if there's like opportunity for bias to be you know involved in there. Analyzed it a million ways, and we say, you know, uh, which publishers do it well, which funders do it well. Uh, you know, like in China, they have a national mandate that you need to share your data, and they have one repository. You just got to put it in, there. and they get good compliance, right? So, might not be the regime approach for me, but it works. Um, whereas the different areas that have um, low-hanging fruit is where I think we should focus our attention, like neuroscience, genetics, things like this. And I actually emailed uh, John Jumper, who is the lead author on AlphaFold. And I said, we're the data repository. We want to make data that's good for your machines to eat. What areas should we focus on to improve the metadata first? And he just replied one word saying everything. I appreciate you're busy, man, but this was pointless. <laughs> so, uh, but I think it makes sense.